who's, um, who's here. I'm um, Betty DeZamba. I'm the chair of Outings and Education for Wild Virginia. Um, we have Misty Bose, who is the director of Wild Virginia. And we have Charlotte Giff, who is um, an intern um, with us this year. And she is a UVA um, student who is studying environmental thought and practice. So now um, I'm gonna go on to the topic for today, which is monarch butterflies, um, biology, ecology, and conservation. And we have um, with us today to talk about this, Michelle Prisby. Michelle um, has a passion for citizen science and monarchs, which began in the late 90s when she launched the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project as part of her graduate research in ecology at the University of Minnesota. She's now the director of the Virginia Master Naturalist Program and an extension faculty member in the Department of Forestry, Forest Resources and Environmental Conservation at Virginia Tech. Um, as part of her job, she manages a statewide network of volunteers who are engaged in environmental education, citizen science, and stewardship to benefit natural resources and natural areas in their communities. For any of you that are not familiar with the Virginia Master Naturalist Program, it has 3,000 members and, um, and the volunteer services that these members um, give back to the state in 2020 um, was worth over $4 million. So it's a, it's a big program and it's a program that does a lot of good. And um, in addition to checking out Wild Virginia's website, I suggest that you check out the Virginia Master Naturalist website as well. So I wanted to just go over a couple of housekeeping things. Um, so when Michelle is giving her talk, she will um, pause at different um, places within the talk to answer questions. Charlotte will be monitoring the Q&A and will be um, you know, sort of feeding those questions to Michelle. So as, you, as Michelle speaks and you think of things that she want to ask, please add them to the Q&A and know that we may not pause immediately for the questions to be answered, but we will pause. Um, if the question is something like, I can't see the slides, we'll, we'll pause and take care of that um, right away. Um, what else? We are going to record this and you will get a link so you can go back and watch parts of it again later on. And I think we, we're expecting that people will ask a lot of questions and if they do, um, the program may last for an hour and a half and we certainly hope that you do ask a lot of questions because I'm sure the things that you're curious about are things that other people will be curious about too. And um, as we get started, I'm going to launch a poll, which is going to ask you about how you found out about us. So if you want to fill that out at your leisure, that would be great. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let Michelle um, share hers. And we'll just take a quick look at the, um, the Q&A and make sure that everyone is, is OK, that they're seeing what they need to see and that they're on. Okay, can you see my slides all right? Um, I can. Okay, great. Um, so I'll give people a chance to um, answer the poll before I start. And while people are doing that, um, I will say thank you so much to Wild Virginia, a really wonderful nonprofit organization um, and to Betty and Misty and to Charlotte for hosting this program here tonight. And welcome to all of you who are here, including our many Virginia Master Naturalist volunteers whose names I recognized in the list. Um, it's great to have you all here. Okay, Betty, do you wanna take the poll down? Um. Otherwise, I think it stays up on the screen. Oh, okay. Yep. Let me let me get rid of the poll. Um, okay. I can't make it go away. Okay. So, um, where we are headed today? Um, I have um, definitely an interest in monarch butterflies from having uh, been a scientist studying monarchs, and then I have a passion for 
community science and citizen science. And um, those two things go together really well because monarchs have a wonderful history of um, people who are not professional scientists being involved in studying them. So tonight we're gonna talk about both of those things. We're gonna talk about basic monarch biology and ecology. Uh, and then we're gonna go through five different monarch community science projects that you can do. So hopefully you'll walk away from this evening knowing something about monarchs that you didn't know before, but also having some ideas for things that you can do to help contribute to the study and conservation of monarchs. And I'm guessing that on the uh, webinar tonight, we probably have a range of people um, who are a, a range of familiarity with monarch biology. And there are probably some people on here who don't know very much about monarchs at all. And some people on here who are pretty much experts in monarch biology. And I will be aiming the, the biology information um, a little bit like to the low end of the middle. Um, so hopefully even those who are experts might pick up something that they didn't know before, but uh, hopefully the people who are new to monarchs will learn a lot. Before I go further, I want to recognize uh, that most of my slides or many of my slides have come from the Monarch Joint Venture um, and I have their website there and some slides from Dr. Karen Oberhauser at the University of Wisconsin. Um, the Monarch Joint Venture is a partnership of federal and state agencies, non-governmental organizations, businesses, and academic programs that are working together to protect monarch migration across the United States. And they do conservation, education, and scientific research. And I really want to call out that organization because it is the best source of accurate research-based information on monarchs. So check out their webinars and fact sheets. I, one thing about monarchs is there can be some misinformation that abounds out there on the internet. Um, and the Monarch Joint Venture is really a very reliable source. Okay, so launching into monarch biology, we are gonna start with the, the life cycle of an individual monarch butterflies. Monarchs go through, like other butterflies, what is called metamorphosis. So they change life stages throughout their life. Um, and the, from egg to adult, there are lots of different changes that take place throughout the life cycle of the monarch butterfly. And each stage has different habitat requirements. So it takes about a month for an egg to grow and change into an adult butterfly. Monarch eggs are about the size of the head of a pin. And one thing to look at in this photo of a monarch egg are the ridges, the lengthwise or longitudinal ridges going down the egg. Whoops. Um, that those ridges are what can help you recognize something as a monarch egg when you're looking at milkweed and not um, the egg of another type of insect or a bubble of milkweed sap, which sometimes can be confusing. So those ridges are really um, helpful to look for. Monarch eggs are normally laid on the bottom of the milkweed leaf to offer protection but eggs can be found on any part of the milkweed plant, including the flowers, the stem, and the top of the leaf, just most often on the bottom. And female monarch butterflies lay on average 500 eggs over the two to five weeks that they live. This is a photo of all five um, stages or instars of the monarch caterpillar together um, to give you a sense of their, their size. So this photo here is actually all of them together so you can see how much they grow. But this, this um, photo on the upper left-hand corner is the hatchling or first instar or stage of the caterpillar. Um, when you see it, when you see it first come out, it does has not yet developed the yellow and black uh, striking coloration that the later instars or stages of the caterpillar will have. It's kind of a lightish yellow grayish color. 
Um, some other note, ways to um, note the monarch caterpillar or larva, they have these tentacles on the front and the back. So two sets, one in the front, one in the back. The front ones are longer um, than the back ones. Um, and their um, growth in their larval stage is really amazing. So it, they take about two weeks from when they hatch to become the um, fifth instar big larva that's ready to pupate, which we'll talk about in a second. So just to give you a sense, here's the size of the egg here. And then you can see the different life stages that it goes through in this photo. And in 2000 weeks, I mean, sorry, sorry in two weeks, they grow 3000 times the size that they were when they hatched. So that's pretty amazing growth. Um, monarchs are really in the caterpillar stage they're an eating machine that's their main mission is to eat um and then as they eat they grow and um they have an exoskeleton like other insects and the exoskeleton can't grow with the caterpillar so the caterpillar has to shed its skin um, when it gets to a certain size and that, those are the stages that are called instars. It's each time it sheds its skin, it goes to a new instar. Um, so the caterpillar will molt four times, becoming a larger caterpillar each time. And then the fifth and final time it molts, it will become a chrysalis. This is a photo of a monarch molting or shedding its skin. Now, before we talk about the forming the chrysalis, chrysalis, I want to make sure to say how important milkweeds are. So as we've already talked about how you would look for monarch eggs on milkweed, that's because the milkweed is the sole host plant for monarch butterflies. It's what the caterpillars will eat. Um, it's what the monarch females will lay their eggs on. Now there are around 15 different species of milkweeds in Virginia. Um, some are much more common than others, but they can all serve as host plants for um, monarchs. Even ones that look quite different um, than others can be monarch food. Um, but some species of milkweed that you might be most familiar with are the common milkweed, um, which you often see on roadsides or in disturbed habitats. The um, commonly called butterfly weed or Asclepias tuberosa, that's the orange flowered um, plant in the bottom right hand side of the screen. That is um, one of the milkweeds that it, you often see in butterfly gardens or it's findable in plant nurseries. Um, so those are a couple that you might be familiar with. Okay, so the monarch has spent its time on the milkweed eating and eating and eating. And then when it is ready to form a chrysalis, it typically crawls several meters away from the plant that it was last eating to find a sheltered area. And that sheltered area is not, it could be on another milkweed plant, but typically it is not. Typically it's gonna be on another type of plant or even on a structure like a fence or a, if you're near, if it's near a house, it might be on the, um, the eaves of a window or a door. It then spins a silk little button with the spinneret that is located beneath its jaws. And once that little button is spun, it, the caterpillar turns back around and then hangs upside down from its abdomen for about 12 to 18 hours. We call this the J stage because they're hanging in sort of a J formation. And then when it's ready, the monarch larva molts one last time. And so you'll see the skin splitting at the back of the head or the neck. And um, once that begins, it only takes about 30 seconds for the molting to finish. So the, the J stage lasts a long time, but then once the actual molt starts, it goes really fast. Um, and so let me click through some of the pictures here as the larva molts and forms that chrysalis. 
Um, at the very beginning, after the chrysalis is formed, it's also called the pupa, um, is, it's still quite soft. Um, within about 30 minutes, um, so this is what it might look like right when it forms, within about 30 minutes, it will um, reshape into what we are most familiar with seeing as a monarch chrysalis or pupa. And it will take about 24 hours to become completely hardened with that sort of waxy feeling on the outside. So then what's happening inside the chrysalis? It is a myth that butterflies and moths turn to soup inside the pupa. So sometimes people think that that's the case, that the, the monarch or other butterfly caterpillar just liquefies and then reforms into a butterfly. That is not the case. Um, and if you look carefully, even a newly formed monarch um, chrysalis will show wing veins beneath the surface. And they stay in the pupal stage for 10 to 14 days. Um, and you know that the pupal stage is about to end and that your the butterfly is going to emerge when you see the coloration of the adult butterfly, that orange and black. The um, casing of the pupa is transparent. It doesn't turn clear, but the color is the last thing, one of the last things to form on the butterfly. So it makes it seem like the chrysalis was green before and then it's um, turning clear, but that's just that the um, what was inside it was green before and then the coloration is developing later. Then it takes um, kind of like the, the uh, forming the pupa, once it actually starts emerging from the chrysalis, it doesn't take long. It only takes about um, 30 seconds to a minute for the butterfly to open up the casing and start making its way out. And we I'll look at, we'll look at a video of this in a second. Um, it's wings, you'll see in the video, when the monarch comes out, um, and if you've ever raised monarchs, the first time you see this, it can be a little alarming. The wings, when it comes out, look really small and deformed uh, because they're all scrunched up. But then the monarch pumps the hemolymph, basically butterfly blood, from its abdomen into its wings to expand them to their full size. And then it will hang there for several hours after it emerges for the wings to dry and harden to their final shape. The monarch adult is still pretty fragile for the first day or two after it encloses or emerges from the chrysalis, but they can fly um, within four or five hours after they emerge, um, their wings are hard enough at that point. So let me get my video. So you can see it's a little alarming where the butterfly looks like it's kind of deformed there at first. But then the wings expand into the, the butterfly that we're used to seeing. So um, then we have the adult monarch butterfly and um, monarch males and females do look different from each other. Um, and many of you may already know how to tell the difference between them. Males have a spot on their hind wings. It's called andraconial patches. And you can see them right here and here. Um, in monarchs, these don't really serve any purpose. In other species of butterflies, they produce and release pheromones. The other way that you can tell the difference between male and female monarchs is that females are a slightly duller orange color and their veins, the black parts, are thicker than in the male. So you can kind of compare that vein on this wing to that vein on the male here and see how it's much thicker in the female. So overall, the, the slightly duller orange and the more black give the monarch female a less bright um, look than when you're looking at the male. 
The other way you can tell the difference between males and females is if you're actually holding it in your hand and you can look at the tip, to, tip of their abdomen, that is a foolproof way to tell the difference between the male and the female. The male has claspers on the end of its abdomen and the females have a little V-shaped notch. The monarchs that aren't migrating, so most of the generations of monarchs, and we'll talk more about that in a bit, live about two to four weeks after they emerge from the pupil stage. And during that time, they have a few jobs to do. They will mate. And then in the case of the female, they will, she will lay eggs. But both of them have to eat. The male and the female do nectar on flowers. And they are not um, specialists. So they do not nectar only on milkweed flowers. They do lay their eggs only on milkweeds, but they will nectar on lots of different kinds of flowers. So um, monarch habitat would have a variety of flowers blooming at different times that are attractive to butterflies in general, as well as milkweed specifically for the monarch female to lay her eggs on. So that's the monarch individual life cycle. And before we go on to talk about the um, annual life cycle, which is the thing that's so particularly amazing about monarchs, I will just pause and ask Charlotte if there are any questions about the individual life cycle. Yeah, so we have um, six questions, or actually seven um, questions here. Um, so the first is, how do we get milkweed to grow in Charlottesville? And then what kind of soil, et cetera? Um, yeah, great. So um, there are different types of milkweeds need different types of soils and situations. There are some milkweeds that grow in more shady spots and some that grow in more sunny spots. Um, so the best thing to do is to look up what milkweed species are um, native to your particular area. And you can do that on the um, digital atlas of the Virginia flora, um, which you can find online. Um, and that will show you which, you can look up um, different milkweed species and it'll show you which counties they occur in. Great. Um, and then another question is um, from M. Kirkby. Um, if I spray deer repellent on a plant, does that harm or discourage butterflies? That's a great question that I do not know the answer to. I imagine it probably depends on what is in the repellent. Um, but you, um, for milkweed, you wouldn't typically need to spray that with deer repellent. I, deer will occasionally eat milkweeds, but they usually don't. Um, if you're thinking about protecting your other flowering plants um, that they might be nectaring on, I would guess that it wouldn't harm um, butter the butterflies that are nectaring on those plants, the typical types of deer spray that I'm familiar with, but whether they can sense those um, smells and would be deterred by them at all, I really don't know the answer. Great, thank you so much. And then, okay, there's more questions coming in now as well. <laughs> I'll just pick it, I have it open, so I can just pick a couple of them um, here. So let's see, um, somebody asks the difference between the a pupa and the chrysalis. So um, the um, pupa is the more general term. So that is what would be used for all butterflies and moths. And the chrysalis is a specific type of pupa. So a cocoon, is another type of pupa. Um, so that's the difference between those two, two words. Um, and let's see, I see um, that CJ asks, how come you don't see clusters of eggs? Yeah, that's a really good question because there are some species of butterflies and moths that um, have uh, larvae that emerge in a group. Um, so they lay a whole bunch of eggs together and then all the caterpillars are together, but monarchs, um, don't do that. They lay their eggs singly. Um, and 
you will sometimes find more than one egg on a milkweed plant. That's certainly possible, but typically a female would lay an egg on a plant and then fly off to a different plant. Um, and so that reduces competition um, amongst the, the larvae um, if they're not all trying to eat the same, the same plant. Um, let's see, okay, I'm going to um, pause here, but I'll come back to some of these questions later on when we're talking about um, conservation and such, because I know there'll probably be more questions than we can get to, but I'll do my best. Okay, so the monarch um, annual life cycle is so interesting. So butterflies have to have a way to overwinter. Um, and different butterflies have different strategies. So uh, butterfly, uh, the morning cloak butterfly uh, might be one that you're familiar with. That butterfly overwinters as an adult. So it hides in a crevice um, of a tree perhaps and um, spends the winter that way. And it has actually it's kind of has antifreeze in it that can um, allow it to survive those cold temperatures of the winter. And that's also why the morning cloak is one of the earliest butterflies that you see in the spring because it has overwintered as an adult. The tiger, Eastern tiger swallowtail, our state butterfly, um, that one overwinters in the pupil stage. Um, but monarchs do not overwinter in any of these stages in Virginia. Monarchs uh, have evolved, their strategy is to get away from winter by migrating. Um, and so when the um, milkweed, their host plant starts to senesce or get old, um, when the nighttime and daytime temperature differential starts to be larger and larger. Um, and as the day length gets shorter, monarchs are cued to um, migrate. And they're actually cued to um, emerge as an adult butterfly in what's called reproductive diapause. So the butterflies that are going to be the ones to migrate are um, not reproductively active. So they're not um, mating and they're not laying eggs, they are storing up fat um, for this big migration. Um, and the monarch migration is one of the largest animal migrations in the world. So monarchs fly all the way from as far north as southern Canada, all the way to central Mexico every fall, which can be up to 3000 miles that they're flying. The population that is west of the Rocky Mountains migrates to the coast of California, which is not as far, but still really spectacular. Um, as you can see in this graphic, um, hopefully the, the animation is working. Um, the migration begins in um, September or maybe late August in the far Northern areas. Um, and then monarchs have usually reached the overwintering sites in Mexico by November 1st, which is um, culturally interesting because that is the Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead in Mexico. Um, and there are a lot of, in that part of Mexico, there are a lot of monarch themed um, costumes and drawings and things that are, um, associated with the Day of the Dead in that area. Um, and monarchs that are making this migration are part of what's considered a super generation. So they will live not the um, month long or two to four weeks of the typical adult butterfly, but these monarchs will live seven to nine months. And part of the way they're able to do that is by not being reproductively active, by putting that energy into those fat stores. So those monarchs will migrate all the way to the overwintering site. They'll live through the winter and then they will migrate part of the way back north again in the spring. Um, so into the Southern United States. So those monarchs are really amazing, living a really long time, making this huge journey in one direction and still a pretty big journey in the return direction. This is a photo from uh, the, the area in Mexico 
uh, where the monarchs migrate to. They are high elevation um, forested mountains. And this, I really love this map. Um, this shows the area where the overwintering sites all are. And this gives the scale. So you can see that this line represents 20 miles. So all of the monarchs in the Eastern United States um, that of that generation are migrating to this tiny, tiny area. Um, there are multiple different locations in this area where they form the overwintering colonies, but the whole area that contains those overwintering colonies is really tiny compared, compared to their summer range. And that I think that also can help you understand why um, this migration and the species are so fragile in that way, because that is just um, a incredible concentration of all of them for the winter time period. And from above, this is uh, what you can see. So the monarchs are basically making the forest look orange. Here are a couple of photos of monarchs at the overwintering sites. And I wanted to include this one just to give you sort of a sense of scale. Um, one year when I was there, we um, took, a, uh, we captured with a net, a, cluster of monarchs that was about the size of a person's torso. And we counted them and there were about a thousand butterflies in one of those clusters hanging there. Um, the monarchs are typically hanging on oyamel fir trees. So a type of, of fir tree that grows in these high elevation forests. And the forest there acts as um, a blanket for the butterflies and as an umbrella. So protecting them um, for the winter, but also keeping them cool, um, cool enough that they can live a long time. In about February, the monarchs become more active at the overwintering sites. They begin flying around and they begin mating in February so that um, the, e the females, when they arrive back to where there's milkweed in the Southern United States, they'll be able to lay eggs. So the spring migration um, starts happening the, um, when the days grow longer and it's warming up, um, they are mating and mating as they migrate along their way north. And this map shows you again how those, um, uh, that spring migration happens over time. They're basically following the milkweed so they're laying eggs along the way. And then those eggs that they lay um, will have the normal lifespan of a monarch, but they will continue the migration north. Um, so they'll follow the milkweed also, um, especially as conditions in the Southern United States become too hot and dry for monarchs and milkweed to tolerate in the middle of the summer. Um, the bulk of the monarch population ends up in the Corn Belt of the Midwestern United States. And then they'll go through another two to four generations over the, the summer growing season. And that last generation is the next ge migratory generation that will make the journey to Mexico. So those monarchs that are gonna migrate have never been to Mexico before. And in fact, their parents haven't been to Mexico before. It was like their great, great, great grandparents that were the ones that made the migration. And yet they find their way to those same forested peaks year after year, which is really amazing. Um, it might be worth mentioning here that um, scientists in the United States only discovered those overwintering sites in the 1970s. Of course, the people who lived there in Mexico knew that the monarchs were there. Um, and, and there are some cultural traditions associating the, um, again, with the Day of the Dead, the arrival of the monarchs as being the souls of their ancestors coming back. Um, but the people in Mexico didn't know where the monarchs were coming from. Uh, the scientists in the United States didn't know where the monarchs were going. In the 1970s, that was um, figured out. And we'll talk about how in just a little while later. 
So, okay, we've been through um, the annual life cycle of the monarch, uh, preparing to migrate in the fall, spending the winter in the overwintering colonies in Mexico, migrating back north and laying the next generation as they find milkweed, and then going through multiple uh, generations that we would see in our part of Virginia, for example, in the summertime, um, laying eggs on milkweed, caterpillars eating milkweed, etc. So a little bit about a monarch conservation. Um, the monarch population, it's pretty hard to count monarchs, right? And know in the summertime, what's their total population. But in the winter, when they are um, all in the same place, that's the best time to count them. And the OML fir trees that host these colonies of monarchs are often called butterfly trees. So the scientists mark the butterfly trees around the perimeter of the area that the colony is taking up. And then they measure that um, distance around it and um, record the time and date that they took those measurements at each colony. And they use mapping software to compute the surface area of each colony. Um, and then they calculate it in hectares. So when we look at monarch populations, we're looking at the number of hectares that they covered in the overwintering sites rather than a count of the number of butterflies. And um, by the way, if hectares is not something you're used to thinking about, a hectare is 2.47 acres, so about two and a half acres. Um, and then scientists use an estimate of 10 to 50 million individual butterflies per hectare. So it's by counting the population in the winter time that we know that the monarch population is declining and that the migration is in jeopardy. This graph shows the total area of monarchs in Mexico measured in the month of December. So again, remember that one hectare is about the same size as two and a half football fields. Um, so in 2013, 2014, for example, which is the lowest mark on here, the monarchs, it took up the space of less than two football fields um, versus the winter of 96, 97, they took up the space of more than 45 football fields. So the, um, on February 25th of this year, um, is when the World Wildlife Fund and the other groups that monitor the monarchs in the winter announced the total forest area occupied by overwintering colony, monarch colonies this past winter. So they located um, nine colonies and covering a total of 2.1 hectares. So here's that on the graph here, which was a 26% decrease from the previous season. So what is going on with monarchs? There are a few different things that are contributing to the decline of monarch populations. So um, just like any animal, they have diseases and predators. So that's something that affects them. Um, weather and climate are a big bummer for them too. So climate in the, the long run, um, because climate change um, can have effects like wet, wetter winters. Um, and when there are wetter winters, monarchs at are, are at a higher risk of freezing. Um, being wet makes them more susceptible to dying when there's freezing temperatures. The use of pesticides is also a hot topic, as is habitat loss all things that can impact monarch populations. Some of these are totally natural causes um, that are, um, do result in the death of monarchs but aren't necessarily the things that are having huge influences over their population numbers. Um, one example of a parasite on monarchs is the tachinid fly. 
If you have raised monarchs before, you might have seen these. The tachinid fly parasitizes by laying eggs in the larva. And then the fly larvae burrow in and basically eat the monarch from the inside out. Um, and then the larvae come out of either the caterpillar, usually when it's in the J stage, or the pupa right after it forms. And you'll see sometimes like a white stringy kind of tendril that they come out on. Um, and the monarch is dead. And you, if you look, you will find the fly larvae or pupae um, afterwards. Monarchs are also susceptible to um, various bacterial and, and viral illnesses. So this is the tachinid fly larva coming out of a chrysalis here. This is a monarch that has this dark one that has some sort of bacterial or viral infection, which sometimes those will cause the um, pupa to turn black. Monarchs can't fly if it's too cold and they will die if temperatures reach too much below freezing. So the weather and climate at the overwintering sites is really important. And a harsh winter in Mexico can mean bad things for a population that's so small and concentrated. And so as climate change, climate change causes winter conditions to change, that's a really serious threat. There are predators that can eat monarchs. Birds do eat them. There are some in Mexico that are immune to the toxins that monarchs have in them. Um, Black-backed orioles and black-headed grosbeaks have both um, learned to eat just the abdomen of the butterfly, which has the lowest concentration of the toxins. Um, but uh, insects and spiders will eat them at any life stage. Um, and those toxins that monarchs have are less effective on invertebrates. A pesticide, and many of you I'm sure are aware of this, of growing concern are the ones in the group neonicotinoids. Um, they're a systemic insecticide, so they make the plant itself toxic, the seed, the nectar, all parts of it. Um, but that's something to watch out for if you are um, purchasing plants and you're hoping to create habitat for wildlife, you definitely want to look for ones that have not been um, treated with that. Insecticides are tend to be non-discriminate, so um, they're going to harm insects that come into contact with them or ingest them, depending on what type of insecticide it is. And th they don't necessarily discriminate between insects that we like and insects that we uh, don't care for as much. So um, definitely the best place to get plants are local nurseries or stores where you know them to be pollinator friendly um, and don't use these systemic pesticides. Um, and places where, especially like local nurseries are gonna be more likely to be able to describe to you where their plants came from and how they were grown. Um, and larger commercial stores may also have plants that are perfectly fine, but they have a long chain of possession so that what an employee knows about what, how the plant has been grown there um, might not tell you everything about the history of the plant that it went through prior to arriving at that particular box store. Habitat loss is definitely a big one. So um, there's habitat loss in both the breeding grounds of monarchs, so where we are, and in the overwintering site. So it's not just a problem for Mexico, right? It's our problem as well to deal with. Um, development, um, agriculture, roads in the breeding grounds are definitely taking away milkweed habitat. So places that were once prairie in the Midwest um, with abundant sources of milkweed and nectar plants are now um, developed areas. In the overwintering grounds, logging is a source of income for people who live there. Um, and Taking a tree here and there uh, might provide them with sustenance and a heat source that they need in the winter, but then it leaves monarchs more exposed, less sheltered from the harsh winter storms. There's also, um, that's like subsistence logging that might happen. There are also sometimes 
um, more like tree poaching kinds of things that are happening on a more um, organized scale. So some of you might have seen the news um, about uh, monarchs and the Endangered Species Act that came out um, late in the late winter. So uh, the, there was a petition to protect the monarch butterfly under the Endangered Species Act. And the US Fish and Wildlife Service came out with their ruling uh, this year and said that adding the monarch butterfly to the list of threatened and endangered species is warranted but precluded by work on higher priority listing actions. So what this means is that the monarch, the monarch has become a candidate for listing under the Endangered Species Act, and its status will be reviewed each year until it's no longer a candidate. So until it actually gets added to the endangered species or a threatened species list, or it's no longer found to be threatened. Okay, so one of the things that you can do along with helping to create and protect habitat for monarchs um, by planting milkweed and nectar sources for them, especially in ways that are similar to natural plant communities that would occur anyway, so you're supporting a whole ecosystem. Um, another thing that you can do that I want to spend the rest of the time talking about is getting involved with citizen science, but I will stop before I go there and try to answer some of the questions that have come in about monarchs. Michelle, did you want me to read those to you? Um, I, if, if you've picked out any that like you especially wanted to jump to. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um... There was a question I saw um, about any efforts to kind of preserve and protect um, monarchs in Mexico. And I don't know if you're maybe gonna get to that or if you know. About yeah, I'm not, but the overwintering sites are protected. Um, so they are, are protected, there are preserves that, are, that have protections around them. That doesn't mean that it's a perfect protection. Um, but they, they do have some protections there and um, the could be maybe improved by making them larger. Okay, and then I saw another question um, about referring back to one of the maps that you showed with dots. Um, and then the question is, if the dots represent population size, um, is it true that there are more monarchs in the Eastern US than there are in the Western US? So I think that you're talking about, sorry to be clicking around. I think you're talking about like one of these graphs, I'm guessing. Yes. Um, and so no, the dots represent an observation of monarchs through a citizen science project. So they, the dots are gonna be heavily, the location of the dots are gonna be heavily influenced by the location of where people are. So if it appears that there are more monarchs, say on the East Coast right here, that's because there's more people to be reporting the monarchs on the East Coast there. Um, let's see, there's a few, looks like there's a couple questions about collecting monarchs, and I might be a good time to say here um, that, and sometimes people don't like to hear this because people have really, some really strong feelings about monarchs, but um, collecting monarchs and raising them in captivity is not a scientifically recognized conservation strategy. So like if you look at Monarch Joint Venture as an example of an organization that is um, very on top of what are the conservation strategies for monarchs, having everybody try to collect the monarchs that they find and rear them in captivity is not a listed strategy. Um, that said, it is okay to um, collect monarchs for other purposes. Um, so if you want to 
raise a small number of monarchs for educational purposes so that you can teach your kids about them, have them get to watch the life cycle or so that you can do an educational program for other people about them or so that you can observe and get to learn about them yourself. Um, that is all okay. Um, there are also some citizen science projects that involve raising monarchs um, to check for parasites and things like that so that um, you're contributing, contributing to a scientific study. But I would not recommend that you collect them thinking that it's a good conservation strategy. Um, so okay to do, but just be aware of why you're, you're doing it. Um, and that is, that's kind of the message on, on collecting monarchs. Um, let's see. Uh, there are a few questions about, um, I know we have probably lots of people on the call from the Charlottesville area. Um, I'll try to speak more generally for Virginia about when we see monarchs. So we could see monarchs um, now, basically like when you see milkweed and my milkweed is up now, not, it's not very big, it's about this big, um, is when you could start seeing monarchs. However, um, I'll show you some a little bit data a little bit later we tend to see more monarchs later in the summer in Virginia. Um, we can see them in April and certainly in May um, and really in any month of the summer, but we tend to see more in say August, but I'll show you some more data on that a little bit later. Okay, I wanna make sure that I get to um, the, citizen science projects that people can participate in. And then I'll try to get to more questions um, as time allows. So let me um, pause for a second. Okay, so there are five different monarch citizen science projects that you can do in Virginia, which is pretty awesome. Um, and citizen science or community science has been around for a really long time, but it is growing rapidly in popularity, um, especially for large scale environmental monitoring projects. And this is where I wanted to come back to um, discovering the overwintering site. So citizen science and monarchs began with Dr. Fred Urquhart and who started something called the Insect Migration Association in 1952. And that is when he began tagging monarch butterflies in hopes of discovering where they were going in the winter. So um, putting little tags on them and then he recruited volunteers, kind of like Virginia Master Naturalist volunteers or Wild Virginia volunteers um, to help with that tagging project and it was um, two citizen scientists were involved in discovering the overwintering sites in 1975, which was called the entomological discovery of the 20th century. Um, since the year 2000, two thirds of research papers on monarchs outside of the overwintering grounds only scientists with permits are allowed in the overwintering grounds, but two thirds of research papers on other time, other parts of the monarch life cycle used citizen science data since 2000. So I, that hopefully gives you a sense of how important um, people like you who are not professional monarch researchers are to actually studying monarchs. And this list shows you all of the different monarch monitoring projects there are that involve community scientists. But we'll just talk about five that are happening in, um, in Virginia and elsewhere. So I'm gonna skip that. Okay, the first one I wanna talk about is called Journey North. And that is where I got the fun graphics that show um, the monarch migration in the fall and the spring. And Journey North is a, a really nice project if you are um, don't want to make a huge commitment. And also if you're interested in linking to education resources, because Journey North um, 
kind of began as a program for classrooms to be able to study migrations of different kinds in the spring. And it's, it's grown, and there are many people who are not youth who are participating in it for sure. Um, but it does, they do still provide great communications and educational activities for classrooms and kids. So it's a really great resource. They also do a symbolic monarch migration in the winter where um, kids in the United States make paper monarchs and they get sent to classrooms um, in Mexico, in central Mexico. So for Journey North, um, you have a number of different things that you can report. So you could report the first monarch that you see in the spring, the first milkweed you see in the spring, the first monarch egg you see, and the first monarch larva or caterpillar. You can also report the first monarch you see in the summer and any additional monarchs you find, but there's not like a set protocol for how you look for them or how many plants you have to look at. In the fall, you can report seeing monarch uh, adult monarchs migrating, the peak migration, so when you're seeing the most flying. Um, if you are lucky enough to see roosting monarchs, so where you have a group of monarchs that are hanging out in a tree overnight, um, and then you can report monarch eggs and larvae as well. So it's a really nice project because you for the, at the absolute base, you just have to be able to recognize adult monarch butterflies and you could report just one thing, like the first monarch, adult monarch you see in the spring or the first one you see migrating in the fall um, and leave it at that. So not super time consuming, um, not complicated. The reporting site is easy online. Um, to do all the different kinds of reporting that Journey North um, does, you would also need to be able to recognize milkweed and recognize monarch eggs and larvae, and then report data online using a simple form. So it's pretty simple. Um, and it allows for these really cool maps where we can look at um, the phenology or the seasonal change of monarchs over time. Like this is showing the for milkweed first sighted in 2015. And so you can look at um, Virginia and get a sense, okay, the week of April 12th to April 25th, or that two week period is about when we would see mono, uh, milkweed emerging that year in Virginia. And we're going to send around the links um, tomorrow via email, so you don't have to rush to scribble things down, um, but this is the link to Journey North to sign up and participate. Okay, next project um, that I want to mention is totally different than that, and that's called Monarch Health. And that project is testing monarchs for a parasite that occurs on them, a protozoan parasite called Ophriocystis electroscura, or OE for short, if you don't wanna say that long name. And monarchs um, have this protozoan parasite, the um, adult butterfly, scatters spores of this parasite on eggs and milkweed when the female is laying eggs and larvae ingest the spores which then go through their life cycle in the gut of the monarch and um, replicate basically until the adult butterfly emerges covered in spores um, that they then shed and spread to the next generation. Um, and there's lots of um, interesting things about this disease and very heavily infected monarchs are impacted and don't migrate as well, for example. Um, monarchs that are not very heavily infected, you might not notice anything. Um, there have not been very many um, uh, tests, or not very many people participating in this monarch health project in Virginia. I just pulled up the map today and it looks like four, five, six, seven, maybe eight um, different sites in, the Virgi in Virginia where people were participating in um, the project with varying results. So if this interests you and you want to contribute to this scientific study of this disease in monarchs, you would need to be able to recognize and capture monarch adults, 
um, or recognize, capture, and safely rear wild monarch larvae. So this is an example of one where you might be raising monarchs in captivity for a scientific purpose. Um, you would need to feel comfortable handling adult butterflies and getting a spore sample, which basically involves taking a sticky piece of tape and putting it on their abdomen and then taping it onto a card so that it can be looked at under a microscope. Um, it's really important if you are um, handling monarchs, um, multiple monarchs repeatedly or rearing monarchs in captivity to keep your, uh, all your supplies and everything that you use disease free, um, which involves bleaching them to sterilize them. And then you would need to be able to mail in a data sheet and your samples. And you can learn more about that project. Um, and my colleague, Sonia Altizer, who runs it at monarchparasites.org. Monarch Watch is one that many people are familiar with. Um, and this is the, the current, the modern version of the tagging program that Dr. Fred Urquhart started. So tagging of monarchs continues. We do already know where they're going now, um, but there's still more to be learned about the routes that they take and the um, timing of when they're migrating and um, mon where monarchs in different parts of the country end up. Um, and the process for studying these things is to um, tag and release monarchs. So it involves um, putting little, a little tiny sticker on the wing of the monarch. Um, and then it will be, if you happen to see a tagged monarch, you would report that. But more often, the tagged monarchs will be found at the overwintering sites if that butterfly made it there. Um, the peak migration time for migrating monarchs in Virginia is usually late September. So that is when you would participate in this project. You don't want to, there's no purpose to tagging monarchs um, earlier in the year that are not going to be the migratory generation. So for this project, you would need to be able to recognize and capture monarch adults. You'd have to buy the tags through Monarch Watch. Um, they're not expensive. It's like $10 for 25 tags or something like that. Um, you have to handle the adult butterflies to tag them and report your data online. And you can find more about that at monarchwatch.org. But again, we'll send you the links. A project that's near and dear to my heart, because I was one of the people who got it started, um, is called the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. And that is a, pro a project to study monarch populations during the breeding season by examining milkweed patches. So volunteers choose their own site with milkweed of any species where they will regularly look at the plants and count monarch eggs and caterpillars that they find. That's the, there are lots of layers to the project and different things that you can do. Um, that's the most basic one. If you wanna do more, there's an opportunity to measure characteristics of the milkweed, um, like height and whether it's in flower or not. And there's also an add-on activity for raising monarchs to measure the rate of those um, tachinid fly parasites. So your MLMP or monarch larva monitoring project site could be your backyard if you have milkweed, gardens, parks, roadsides. You just need to make sure that there's milkweed there and that you have permission to be there if it's not your own property. Um, once a year, you would do a site description where you um, have to measure the density of the milkweed growing there and some other basic things about the site. And then the monitoring of the monarch population happens on a weekly basis. So you're out thoroughly examining um, a sample of the milkweed plants or all of the milkweed plants, depending on your site, and looking for any eggs and caterpillars that you can find. And this is a map of all the MLMP monitoring sites in the United States that have ever um, contributed data. So we do have um, some in Virginia, but not very many in central Virginia, you can see. So um, certainly more data would be helpful there for understanding the patterns of when monarchs are in this area and when they're not in the area, when they're um, having a, a 
strong population year during the breeding season and when they're not. These are data from um, 2020 from all the people in Virginia who did this project. So that was 26 sites contributed data in 2020. Um, and it, um, the earliest ones monitored were late April, um, going through mid-October. And you can see that um, most monarchs that were found were found in August and into September, as we talked about before. So the blue on this graph are the eggs, um, if you focus on that part. And then there are the other caterpillar stages as well. And that is a fairly typical pattern um, from what I've seen in Virginia, although um, to have not seen any in the spring, I'd say is more unusual, but I don't know how many sites were, how many of these 26 sites were looking at that time, because not all of them were necessarily looking for the entire season. So for this project, you need access to a site with milkweed and to be able to recognize milkweed species, because if you're going around looking for monarchs on a plant that turns out to not be milkweed, then that's not uh, so useful. Uh, you need to be able to recognize monarch eggs in those five larval and stars caterpillar stages. You have to take the time to do the mon monitoring on a weekly basis and then report your data online at mlmp.org. And then um, the last project that I'll mention is um, somewhat more intense, um, but also more um, scientifically useful in some ways. So um, just to go back to the graph of the monarch larva monitoring sites, um, those sites tend to be in places where people live and have seen monarchs. So they're not randomly distributed. Um, this project, the Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program, aims to look at monarchs in a more um, randomly sampled way that will uh, tell us a little bit more about how milkweed habitat and monarchs are distributed across the landscape. Um, and so there are designated areas um, and volunteers can choose to monitor sites that they can find within those designated areas and record um, monarch population numbers and habitat characteristics at those sites. So you would need to be able to access a site with milkweed, um, but hopefully with, um, you know, that would be in one of the areas that's been designated um, to be part of the project. You need to be able to recognize milkweed species and other blooming plants because that's part of the project to talk about or uh, to report data on the habitat in general. Recognize the monarch eggs and the, uh, the larval instars. Describe basic characteristics of the site. Depending on what activities you're doing, the monitoring might only be monthly. So it might not be as often as the MLMP. And again, you report your data online. So those are all of the five citizen science projects that I know about that um, people in Virginia could participate in to help study monarchs. And I think they are all um, useful in different ways and studying different stages and aspects of monarchs. And I really encourage you to um, pick any of them that you think are interesting and give it a try. And with that, I will stop sharing and see if I can help answer some more questions. So Charlotte, did you have any that were picked out? Yeah, well, this is, I guess, kind of a, a summary of questions because I've seen a bunch of questions about um, milkweed and then I guess specific to maybe more specifically to people who are um, in Virginia about um, starting seeds milkweed varieties, et cetera. Um, so maybe could you give some sure. like broader advice about that? Yeah, um, so let's see, some broader advice. Um, milkweeds don't typically transplant very well. So I don't recommend trying to dig up a mature milkweed plant and put it somewhere else. Um, 
they you can um, transplant them and that you can plant a really small little um, plug or little tiny seedling into the ground um, that you've started from seed, but just don't try to transplant the larger plants. They have a long tap root and it's generally not terribly successful. Um, then it comes down to what you can find that is native to your part of Virginia. Um, and the depending on where you are, there might be some different species that are native to where you are. Um, and three or two that are commonly found in garden stores are swamp milkweed, Asclepias incarnata, that tends to like a somewhat wetter habitat, and um, Asclepias tuberosa, that's the orange flowered butterfly weed um, that you see. And that tends to do a little bit better in a more sandy soil. Um, but it, it, both of those are commonly grown in gardens. And then less often found at a garden store, but if you can come by some seed, um, the common milkweed is um, certainly easy to grow um, if you can get it started and it's because it acts like a weed. Um, it will not stay in the place that you put it. Um, so be prepared for it to choose where it wants to pop up. Um, and as long as you're okay with that, that's one that's a possibility. And there are other species as well, but being able to um, get seed for them or plant plugs is somewhat more challenging. Great, thank you. And then I'm gonna try to summarize some of the other, I guess, things that I'm seeing in here, um, just because there are so many questions. Um, so another, I guess basic theme seems people are really um, interested in trying to figure out how they can get involved in helping monarchs. Um, so maybe other than like the citizen scientists things that you mentioned, um, what are some other ways that people can help other than that maybe planting milkweed? Yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, um, anything that is going to um, help protect habitat for butterflies um, is, monarchs will be part of that most likely because, um, you know, they need the nectar sources as well as the milkweed. So I think um, supporting parks and natural areas in um, mowing less or in doing habitat restoration efforts will naturally help monarchs as well as lots of other species. Um, you can create monarch habitat yourself, um, like we talked about with, with planting milkweed and, and nectar plants, um, and probably in terms of conservation will be most successful all around if you try to um, think about supporting an ecological community rather than just one species. Um, other ways you can help monarchs, you can um, be an educator and teach other people about monarchs so that they have um, raised awareness about this really cool butterfly and its amazing migration. You can um, donate money is another way to, to help monarchs. So um, organization, there are numerous monarch conservation organizations. Monarch Joint Venture is one that I particularly respect. So um, that's a possibility as well as all of the citizen science um, things that we mentioned. Great, thank you so much. Um, I see there's a couple, it seems like there's a few questions about monarchs worldwide distribution um, and people asking where else in the, the world they occur. So they are native to the Americas. Um, but they spread throughout the world in the 1800s. So they are in the South Pacific, in Australia and New Zealand, and they also live in Portugal and Spain. Um, that is not where they originated, but they have been able to live there. But I don't think that they have spread across the rest of Europe.
Um, I also saw a few questions about tropical um, milkweed and whether that's safe or okay. Um, could you address that? So um, I think it would be going too far to say that it's unsafe to plant um, tropical milkweed for monarchs here in Virginia. It's a little bit more of an issue in the far south um, of the United States where it wouldn't die back in the winter because um, when you have milkweed that stays around um, all winter long, then monarchs can maybe also stay there all winter long and not migrate. And when they do that, then the that protozoan parasite builds up in the population. So, so there's some, if you've seen a lot of negative things about tropical milkweed in part, it's from places like that, like the Gulf Coast states, for example. In Virginia, your tropical milkweed should still die back in the winter. However, I think um, overall as a conservation strategy, it is always much better to stick with plants that are native to your particular area because that will be supporting a whole ecosystem and those plants will be adapted to the growing conditions of where you are. Um, and that's generally better than introducing a plant that isn't meant to be here. Let's see, any other big ones I should get to? Um, let's see, there's another one about um, the, the flowers that monarchs nectar on and what um, top three or maybe top flowers those are that they really like. I'm not even sure that there would be a top um, several because they really are not specialists when it comes to the flowers that they nectar on. So if you, native plants, if you just Google or look in any sort of native plant finder for ones that are attracted to butterflies in general, monarchs will probably go to them and they'll use different plants in different seasons. So, um, you know, they'll use, um, I'm thinking about the upper Midwest here, a uh, plant that would bloom um, there when I was in Minnesota is um, Liatris, Blazing Star, and it would bloom in the late summer at the time when monarchs would be migrating. And so it was very attractive to them at that time. But um, I think the species that I'm familiar with of Liatris in Virginia blooms a little bit earlier than that. So maybe not so much. Um, I think knowing that um, monarchs are migrating through here uh, or coming and laying eggs here in August and then migrating in September, um, looking for late blooming plants um, would be particularly good in Virginia. Although again, we can have monarchs anywhere from April all the way through early October. So you really wanna provide them a buffet all year long, but especially thinking about those flowers um, that bloom in August and September, I think would be helpful like Joe Pye weed, um, New York ironweed are two commonly available um, plants you can grow in a butterfly garden that would be native to a lot of Virginia. Great, I don't know, I mean, there's, a bunch of other questions in here. I think we got some of the big ones. Okay, good. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there's there's another question I see about um, the citizen science projects, and then if those are available for master naturalist volunteer hours. Um, I think most of them probably would be, but of course you need to check with your local chapter and get the project uh, approved by your local chapter. But if you need help with um, proposing that project for your chapter or need information to write up in your project proposal form, I'm happy to help you with that. Yeah, I see Dell says asters also. Yeah, um, that's another flower or some species of asters that bloom later in the year would be another good one for migrating monarchs. Let's 
see. All right, yeah, I think we got to a lot of the big ones, so that's good. Um, thank you for such good questions. People asked some really interesting ones that um, that I hadn't even ever seen before. I don't know if anybody had asked me um, about Monarch's worldwide distribution before, so that was um, great that somebody wanted to know about that. Um, it was really fun to get to talk to you all tonight. And um, although in the webinar format, I feel like I, I didn't get to hear from you as well as in the other format, but um, it did allow a lot more people to participate, which is great. Um, and thank you so much to Wild Virginia for hosting this. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Misty and Betty for some closing. Okay, well, just, just thanks so much, Michelle. That was great. Um, I hope everybody learned a lot. I'm sure they did. And I love that there's opportunities for us to help out. Um, so I want to just thank everybody for coming. And maybe Misty wants to say a thank you as well. I do. I do. As a master naturalist myself who does not keep up with her hours, I want to thank you for your program and all that I've learned from the master naturalist since I moved to Virginia. And uh, certainly tonight, I learned a lot about monarchs as well. And I know Betty touched on this at the beginning, but Wild Virginia has made it a big priority to, to think about the landscape through the eyes of wildlife, um, whether that's you know a deer crossing a road or a butterfly trying to make its epic migration. So um, thank you for helping us understand the species a little bit better. And I'm also here to remind everyone that if you're not a member of Wild Virginia, please become one. I'll be sending out a follow-up email so you can join as quickly as you like and renew your membership if you want. And one of the best things about membership right now is you get discounts at several native plant nurseries. So Hummingbird Hill and Little Blue Stem Nursery where you can go pick up native plants that were mentioned tonight. So I'll be sending that out. Um, please, please join us. We count on you to keep doing things like this. Um, and thanks again, Michelle. Thanks again, Charlotte. Thanks, Betty. And thanks all of you who tuned in. Thank you. All right, good night, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good night.